Hi, today we are going to talk about uh, some additional clinical pearls related to critical care and go over some take home messages. I have no financial disclosures with regards to this presentation. I am an advisor for a tele ICU company as listed there, but should not be relevant to today's talk. So the first thing that I wanna to talk to you about today is severe alcohol withdrawal syndrome. This is something that we obviously see very often in intensive care units and is something that hasn't been covered so far in this course. So as many of you know, alcohol binds um, to receptors on the GABA complex. Um, and uh, GABA is a major inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain. The more alcohol one drinks, the higher the tolerance, therefore the more alcohol is needed for the same effect. And overall alcohol is a sedative and causes memory impairment. Alcohol also inhibits glutamate induced excitation of NMDA receptor, which is important for maintaining wakefulness. Um, so when a patient drinks alcohol routinely or in excess, more glutamate receptors are made as an adaptation to this. The lack of alcohol or a re significant reduction in alcohol results in no inhibition of GABA and excess excitation of NMDA, and that's where the withdrawal syndrome um, occurs. Dopamine is also increased during withdrawal leading to hyperarousal, so several different mechanisms involved in this. So many of you probably know that alcohol use is the seventh leading cause of death and disability in the United States with approximately 8 million Americans being alcohol dependent. Up to 7% of patients who are admitted to a hospital just for general care are likely to develop severe alcohol withdrawal. This is a table from up to date that uh, just goes through the different uh, types of alcohol withdrawal syndrome starting from minor to delirium tremens, which is the most significant and severe, and uh, the clinical findings during those times as well as onset after the last drink. And so the first two, the minor withdrawal, the tremulousness, mild anxiety, et cetera, and the seizures can start as early as six hours from the last drink and usually are seen uh, 36 to 48 hours, up to 36 to 48 hours. The alcohol hallucinosis can start around 12 hours after the last drink, and, uh, but can present up to 48 hours. And then delirium tremens, the one that actually uh, has the most morbidity associated with it and actually is the usual reason why patients end up in the ICU, that onset is 48 hours after the last drink and can be up to 96 hours. So this is a nice um, table to sort of remind us of when we might see some of these adverse effects of the patient going without alcohol. So uh, this is a slide about delirium tremens, which is what I'm gonna talk about for the next few minutes. The reason being that is what's normally seen in the ICU. Uh, the picture on the screen is actually from a bar in Belgium. Um, and they're absolutely right. If you are drinking a lot and then stop drinking, you are at a significant risk of developing this very bad uh, syndrome. It's about 5% prevalence in uh, alcohol withdrawal. So not everyone who goes into alcohol withdrawal is going to get it. In fact, the majority do not. But for those that do, it can be quite severe and um, a significant cause of mortality. So when uh, we're thinking about whether or not someone has delirium tremens, the definition is important to remember. So this in, the patient can have hallucinations, tachycardia, hypertension, disorientation, agitation, fever, diaphoresis, and of course, all of these have to occur in the setting of reduced or lack of alcohol intake. Delirium tremens is not the same as alcohol hallucinations. Uh, all patients have symptoms of alcohol withdrawal prior to developing DTs. The risk factors uh, for who is going to get the DTs are patients obviously who have a history of alcohol use um, but more specifically, people who have already had withdrawal seizures are a little bit older, age greater than 30, and those who've had a longer time since their last drink. Remember that table I showed you a few slides ago. The clinical manifestations um, are listed here below. So like I mentioned before, the hypertension, tachycardia, there's increased oxygen consumption. The patient um, uh, hyperventilates and so is causes a respiratory alkalosis, uh, which leads to a high blood pH, and that can 
cause decreased cerebral blood flow. The patients typically are hypovolemic. They have low potassium, low phosphate, and low magnesium, and that low magnesium can predispose to dysrhythmias and seizures as well. So this is a, another table from up to date, which uh, gives you some suggestions on patients with alcohol withdrawal, who should go into the ICU, some criteria for admission to the ICU. This is a guide. And I think that everybody's home institution is different. And uh, you should think about these sort of things when you're determining whether or not a patient should be in the ICU. But of course you have to um, think about what your own institution, what the floor can handle versus the ICU. But most of these things listed here are um, conditions that would make all of us think that the patient might do better in a closer monitored situation, such as an intensive care unit. So most of us use, when we get somebody admitted to the hospital, either who are already are in alcohol withdrawal or we know that they have a history of um, alcohol use and we're worried about alcohol withdrawal, we use the CEWA protocol. The problem with CEWA is that it is a heavy burden on nursing time. They have to ask the patient these questions every 15 minutes sometimes. Um, once you get started with the, um, the response to the patient's questions, the doses of lorazepam uh, can be quite high and lorazepam and benzodiazepines in general increase the risk of delirium already. And they also are respiratory depressants. Um, and the most interesting thing is that see what cannot be used if the patient is unable to respond to questions or can't be cooperative. So what else can we do in these uh, sort of situations? Well, one thing that we're doing at our bedside and that there's a number of papers now published is to use phenobarbital either in conjunction with a benzodiazepine or on its own. So phenobarbital is actually interesting. Many of us know it as a medicine for epilepsy or seizures, but uh, it works by potentiating GABA receptors and antagonizing acti activity on NMDA. So it works in the two spots where alcohol is affecting uh, brain chemistry and brain function. Also, its anti-epileptic properties is helpful in patients in alcohol withdrawal to help prevent seizures. Ideally, um, chemically, we would want to give phenobarbital with a benzodiazepine because they do work synergistically on the GABA chloride channel, uh, but there are some places that use phenobarbital alone. The nice part about phenobarbital is it has a long half-life, so once you get the patient calm and under control, there's not a lot of redosing. So that's what's different um, also from CIWA and some of the other agents that are being used is that uh, once the patient is under control, this medicine lasts a long time and the taper uh, can be easily established. Uh, some of the protocols that are out there using this um, start at 260 milligrams IV every 15 to 20 minutes until symptoms are controlled. Uh, again, that is for somebody who is severely impaired. This is from a paper from two years ago, the American Journal of Critical Care Medicine, just showing you um, the phenobarb dosing that they used. And you can see up here, the patients who had active DT got higher first dose and a longer taper versus the people who um, did not have any history of delirium tremens and were not actively in delirium tremens. And so this um, paper actually showed a nice protocol that you could use at the bedside. And they also demonstrated when they compared it to patients who uh, were being treated with the CWA, which is what we um, have become quite calm, uh, quite used to using, is that patients who were treated with the phenobar protocol that was on the last slide had a shorter ICU stay, which is circled there, as well as a dramatically decreased use of ventilator. Why is that? Well, because they probably got calm early on and didn't need that much more as time went on. Whereas with CYA, you're using larger and larger doses of lorazepam and benzodiazepines and can uh, lead to some over sedation in these patients. It's a very interesting study and something worth considering uh, for your bedside practice. Uh, serum levels can be followed on phenobarbital. The patient may need to be um, intubated because it is indeed a sedative. And if you are using it in conjunction with the benzodiazepine, I would highly recommend the patient be in the ICU and you have a low threshold for intubation. It is metabolized by the liver and some other drugs do alter the serum concentration, so it's important to monitor that. 
Other medications we use in the ICU for alcohol withdrawal um, include propofol, which also works on GABA and NMDA receptors. Um, people who are on propofol require intubation though, so there's, um, there is that uh, morbidity associated with it, uh, but propofol also has some anti-epileptic properties. There are side effects to propofol, as many of us know, that um, hypotension and um, longer duration mechanical ventilation, which often can lead to longer length of stay. And then dexmedetomidine, which is used very commonly now for alcohol withdrawal. Um, the interesting thing about dexmedetomidine is that it actually treats the symptoms of alcohol withdrawal rather than the cause. So it's an alpha-2 uh, adrenal receptor agonist, uh, which is great. So all those cardiovascular side effects and things like that um, are treated and the patient looks calm. You can use it on a patient who is not intubated because it doesn't have respiratory depressive uh, side effects. Um, it reduces the amount of benzodiazepine needed and can decrease mechanical ventilation days, ICU length of stay and hospital length of stay. The problem with it is um, it can lead to hypotension and bradycardia and uh, it still is quite costly and not on formulary in a lot of places. Uh, the thing I uh, want to remind people, though, is that dexmedetomidine is not treating the cause, it's treating the symptom. So it does make the patient look okay, but, it, um, but some of the other agents may be better at treating the underlying cause. So to summarize, just some things on alcohol withdrawal and critically ill patients. Best treatment is prevention and early detection. detection. Benzodiazepines are still the first-line therapy, but we have emerging data now on some other agents, such as phenobarbital, I know some places are using ketamine, but there's no hard data yet to sort of support that. Um, propofol works well for intubated patients. And of course, do not forget the supportive care because these patients have electrolyte abnormalities and need IV fluids, thiamine, glucose, multivitamins, et cetera. So another um, condition in the ICU that hasn't been touched on yet uh, during this course is hyperglycemia. And I think we've heard quite a bit about hyperglycemia in the last 10 to 15 years in the critical care literature. This was one of the first studies that came out from the New England Journal of Medicine. This is the NICE sugar study, which was a randomized controlled trial of over 6,000 patients in the ICU. And they were looking at whether or not intensive insulin therapy with a goal of a blood glucose between 81 and 108 was better than conventional, which is just keeping the blood glucose less than 180. And the primary endpoint for this study was um, death at, from any cause at 90 days. And so here are the graphs uh, looking at this. And the top graph just shows the conventional glucose control in the orange and the intensive insula, insulin um, therapy in the blue. And you can see the y-axis here is blood glucose and the conventional glucose control is um, obviously has a higher average daily glucose than the intensive therapy. Same thing is shown in the lower graph as well. That's no surprise. But the surprise came when they did this Kaplan-Meier curve, which is on the top here, looking at survival, probability of survival. And the orange is the conventional glucose control, and they did better than the blue, which is the people with the intensive glucose control. And it's summarized more in the lower graph. So the people with the conventional glucose control actually did better overall. So this really made us wonder, what were we doing about worrying about hyperglycemia in the ICU? And so to highlight um, the findings from this study, death from cardiovascular causes were more common in the intensive insulin therapy group. There was no difference in median length of stay or ICU length of stay. The intensive, ins the intensive insulin group had more severe hypoglycemia um, and overall increased mortality with that group as well, even after controlling for many co-founders. So what else was published during this time? Well, the CORTIS study was published during this time, and this looked at corticosteroids and intensive insulin therapy for septic shock. So patients who were on corticosteroids were randomized to either the intensive insulin therapy or conventional. And we all know that when patients get corticosteroids, their glucose levels go up. And so this was an interesting group to look at. And this study found no difference in mortality, ICU length of stay, ventilator-free days, or vasopressor-free days, interestingly. 
And then finally, this study, the volume substitution in insulin therapy and severe sepsis. It was a multi-center medical surgical ICU study, and it compared the intensive insulin to conventional. Um, interestingly, in this group, the patients did have different volume resuscitation approaches, but this study actually ended early because of the high rate of hypoglycemia in the intensive insulin arm and serious adverse events. So again, it started looking like lower glucose or episodes of hypoglycemia in the intensive insulin therapy actually ended up being more dangerous than allowing the glucose to get higher. But why is hypoglycemia bad? Because it can lead to seizures, brain damage, depression, cardiac arrhythmias, and death. So for now, there's no universally accepted insulin regimen for glucose control in critically ill patients. Hyperglycemia is associated with poor outcomes. Hypoglycemia is associated with poor outcomes. And so many of us uh, just recommend trying to keep the blood glucose between 140 and 180. Um, and that seems to, in all the studies, be associated with lower mortality and fewer episodes of hypoglycemia. And probably the best way to control blood glucose is to have an insulin protocol uh, that is nurse-driven rather than trying to determine insulin use at every blood glucose value uh, independently. So a couple things I wanna highlight from other talks during this course. So for sepsis, um, of course, one of the most important things and continues to be, it was identified in 2016, but it continues to be, you need to know early source identification and control. If you cannot control the source of the sepsis, you're gonna have a hard time treating the sepsis. And then early volume resuscitation with crystalloid are also two things that are super important when you're treating patients with sepsis. For patients who are mechanically ventilated, uh, it was true years ago and it remains true today that the tidal volumes need to be low, uh, four to eight milliliters per kilogram. Plateau pressures need to be less than 30. This is to prevent barotrauma to the Higher PEEP sometimes works versus lower PEEP, and prone positioning can be helpful in some patients with ARDS. And actually, interestingly, um, in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic, we found these patients to respond pretty well to prone positioning as well as a higher PEEP with the lower FiO2. Uh, there, I am sure many papers will be coming out regarding that in the next few months, but that is just anecdotally what we saw at the bedside. And finally, to end, I just wanted to review some things that are super important in the ICU and the care of our critically ill patients. Pain is important to assess with validated tools and to manage the opiates as best as possible. Um, there are non-pharmacologic uh, ways to address pain as well, and nurse-driven protocols are extremely helpful in this regard. Agitation is a common problem in critically ill patients, um, and uh, sedating them is important to prevent harm from them pulling out lines and things like that, but lighter sedation overall is better than deep sedation. So if a patient is on a sedative that's a continuous infusion, a daily interruption is a, uh, an important thing to do if possible. Delirium is something that needs to be assessed regularly. Uh, there, so far to date, there is no medication that you can give to prevent delirium. Um, but there are plenty of behavioral things that we can do to prevent delirium, such as reorienting the patient, lighter sedation, waking the patient up daily if possible, avoiding benzodiazepines. Those are all simple things to do to try to prevent delirium. Immobility has been associated with bad outcomes in critically ill patients. The longer someone's immobile, the more muscle atrophy and difficulty they have with rehabilitation. So early mobilization in patients is extremely important and, and has been associated with better outcomes. And then finally, sleep. ICU patients are known to sleep very poorly, and this poor sleep can have many consequences. Uh, Non-pharmacologic intervention is what's recommended, not necessarily sleeping pills. So daylight cycles are extremely important. Noise during the day, the curtains open, reorienting the patient, lighten the sedation during the day, and then lights off, make it quiet, close the curtains, turn the TV off, things like that at night so that the patient knows it's nighttime and it's time to sleep. At this point, it's the best that we have. 
we hope that we will do better with sleep in critically ill patients uh, in the future. So with that, I will end my talk and um, I thank you for listening. <laughs>